we're working with the city to do some interspersed affordable housing around the city. And Paul Reeves, our construction director, came in and said, um, hey guys, I found a great lot down in South Asheville, but when I was looking at the title, I found this. No unlawful or immoral use shall be made of the herein described property, nor shall the same, nor any part thereof, nor any interest herein, be sold, leased, or otherwise conveyed to, or be permitted to be occupied by, person of the colored race. Should we buy a piece of property with that kind of language attached to it? What signal does that send to our homeowners? And the conclusion that we came to is yes, it's really important for Habitat not only to, to blatantly defy this racist history, and then also to raise the profile of, of this issue and how our city was shaped by, by decisions like this. Racially restrictive covenants were tools that were used by real estate developers in the 19th and 20th century to prevent people of color from buying or occupying property. So often it was just a few lines of text, but these lines were inserted into deeds and they were um, written into neighborhood covenants literally across the country, but specifically here in Asheville. Asheville really leaned into it. And as the Register of Deeds, I often see them written in documents throughout everything from the 1910s to the 19, all the way up to the 1970s. Residential segregation laws are first passed in municipalities in the early 20th century. And Asheville, as you know, passes their uh, residential segregation law in 1912. And so those laws are really influential in kind of dividing the cities up um, and supporting racial segregation by neighborhood. But they are overturned in 1917 because they're found to be unconstitutional. At the same time, the deadly racial unrest of the Red Summer of 1919 really stoked fear and led to a dramatic spread of the use of racial restrictive covenants across the country and in places like Asheville. In the 1920s, the restrictive covenants began to be used with the kind of ur urban and suburban developments across the United States. They are written into deeds to prevent black and white families from living in the same neighborhoods, but then they become really fundamental to federal housing policy in the 1930s with the Federal Housing Authority, the FHA loans that are kind of a one of the cornerstones of Roosevelt's New Deal policy. Home ownership is the basis of a happy, contented family life. And now, through the use of a National Housing Act insured mortgage, is brought within the region. The understanding on the part of federal authorities and banks and real estate folks is that homes have more value if they're white owned. And so, you know, this goes on for decades and decades. And even after restrictive covenants are found to be unenforceable in 1948 and then abolished in 1968 with the 1968 Civil Rights Act. But by then the damage is done, right? The, the patterns of development within our cities, particularly around suburbanization, that's already happened. The system worked incredibly well to, um, to perpetuate white wealth and to undermine uh, assets in the black community. I will be the first person in my family to own a home, which is really exciting. It just creates stability. Um, it's just a place for growth. It's our home. It's not somewhere that's temporary. I could decorate our home. You know, it's important. It's a foundation for us to grow and learn. I always just had it in the back of my mind that I would never have enough money to put a down payment on a house. I never even looked into it. It was just kind of me just doubting myself because no one in my family owns a home. So I never thought to look into it until my friends and family started pushing me to get it done. And I'm happy I'm doing it at such a young age. So hopefully we get to enjoy it together, you know, when it's paid off years from now. 
This is the first time in uh, the 25 years that I've worked with Habitat that I can remember um, seeing a racially restrictive covenant on a piece of property that Habitat uh, had purchased. And I think that speaks to how pervasive and powerful these deed restrictions are because areas like this in our communities that, um, that were segregated legally, they still retain their value to a point where it's very difficult to, um, to develop affordable housing in places that were deed restricted. So Andy Barnett, the executive director, reached out to my program director, Justin Edge. He asked us if we could look into the deed and if there was anything we could do to remove that restrictive covenant. So one reason that they haven't been removed, at least in North Carolina, is that we don't currently have any legislation that enables folks to remove these racially restricted covenants from, their, from the chain of title for their home. So what will happen now, because um, Habitat filed the termination of the restrictive covenant that we drew up. Now when somebody searches through the history of that home, they're gonna see this termination of the restrictive covenant that says we know that this is in the history and the title of this home. We renounce that and here's, how, here's where we Habitat stands. As long as something was recorded in the Register of Deeds office, it will forever be on record. So you're not gonna erase the past. What we have the choice in is what, how we want to move forward. Do we want to say that we are an inclusive community going forward and that we have inclusive neighborhoods? That's what we have to say in today is how we want to move forward. And I think we should also not gloss over the past. I think we should call it out as well. I mean, without land, there's no place. Without ownership, there's no control. No influence, no power. Uh, my family's been in this neighborhood for over 100 years. I'm a native. My family, they say my family been in these mountains for over 200 years. If my family didn't have land in this neighborhood, I don't think I would be here right now. So with hood huggers, the first thing we want to be able to identify space, rebuild that space, uh, and then create some type of sustainable maintenance plan for that space and then monetize it and then to always keep in mind that any resources that's generated in those areas go back to continue to maintenance and rejuvenate so when you talk about being marginalized and not being able to get homes and all that it's like when you were when you did have a home you have something to leave behind. You had, you know, you had resources, you had land to pass down to the next generation. I think now we got to be thinking the same thing. Let's build out these spaces, but not only just build them out for now, but build them out and train the people behind us and know the value of the space. Where does generational wealth start with? And I can tell you you know, from working 40 years in banking and with real estate. When you're black in America, you couldn't build wealth like the opportunities you had if you were white. And now I look at what's changed in Asheville with gentrification. When I look at the new reevaluation and we look at the different communities and areas, I look at how the property and what historically were the black community, was the black communities, you know, around Asheville, but how the property is appreciated. That's why it's important to talk about these places and to try to take the money to reinvest and protect what's left of the African American community. Down the street from the Martha Square, what we used to call the Martha School, was Stumptown. That's where I was born and raised as a young girl growing up. That's gone. That's where we grew up, and it was, you know, it was an African-American neighborhood, but eventually, you know, it, it, everything got moved around and shifted, and so there were one or two houses left over there. On Gray Street, which is right off Pearson Drive, where I came up in 50, when Mom and Dad bought that house, Dad paid $3,500 for that house, and he bought a lot right next to it. In 68, when they moved, the house and lot, he sold it for thirteen five. Fast forward in the 90s, I was approving a loan, and it was for 38 Gray Street. I said, oh, okay, $168,000. On the other hand, 
where we are on now West Haight in 68, where they built turnkey job, land and all. If they had 19,000, today that same house is worth over a quarter of a million dollars in tax value. The way neighborhoods look isn't an accident. Neighborhoods are the way they are uh, because they were designed to function that way. Shallow is changing and I expected that. Um, and, and I have nothing, I mean, I'm fine with being mixed. I just want, want some of the folk who have been part of Shallow, especially, and parents have invested in Shallow to let's, let's try to hang on to some of those properties. And we're really encouraging that but shallow it has turned into a hot place for people who are looking for a home and whoever, whatever they look like. So it's just really a great neighborhood. I started paying attention and I found some old redlining maps of Asheville and where not only was it restricted, but they had the sections where the Jewish community was in North Asheville and you could see where they had circled, which was the historically black neighborhoods like East End, where I lived off Marford, the area they call Stumptown, where I came up in. But you could see how Asheville, you know, I thought that everybody just moved coming up here, they wanted to be together. But then I found out, wait a minute, this was orchestrated. They knew what, you know, what they were doing. Um, you hear a lot about redlining, but you don't really hear a lot about how we got to redlining. And so one thing that, that I learned doing this project was that racially restrictive covenants were introduced as a way to get around racially restrictive zoning. If you look at the ways slavery gave way to Jim Crow, gave way to mass incarceration, we know that the pattern of, of discrimination changes its face from generation to generation, but it doesn't go away. When we try to address it, we, we talk about it in silos. But we need to address it the same way it was implemented. It was policy, blood, and resources, all the way up from the feds, all the way down, right in the neighborhoods itself. And, and, I, and, and it trips me out how we not trying to address the problem in the same way. That's the part. It makes me say creative pretending that we are not really trying to fix it. We say we want to fix it, but we're not using the same amount of intensity and resources and policy that created it to, to, to help address it in a real, real way. But how does that transfer over to what we got to do today to try to address it? That's where we supposed to be. And I talk about that on the tour. So how do we flip that right now today? For, for, for the future so that everybody can get down and, and, and live right. And in order for us to level the playing field, we have got to correct these institutions that we have. And we can't think about, okay, we've closed the achievement gap in the schools. Gow, we can sit back and relax. No. We still have the housing, we still have the criminal justice system, we still have the health disparities. We've got to think in the total picture of what we need to do. We're going to have to be open and honest with each other. We're going to have to have painful conversations. And in America, these are the type of conversations nobody likes to have. But in my neighborhood, specifically in Melbourne Hills, North Carolina, we, had, we went back and we specifically noted that our neighborhood was originally set up to be a racially discriminatory white neighborhood that barred African Americans from home ownership. And we went back and we said, we called it out and we said this is wrong and we are now an all-inclusive neighborhood and that was voted on by our board and we put it on record. And I think that is a model that other neighborhoods could follow and I think on a personal level, homeowners could do it in their own personal deeds as well. So when I was bringing up into my neighborhood, there were some residents who were like, we don't want to uh, touch this. But there is this piece of this, we don't want to talk about hard things. It's just like, no, we have to talk about hard things. We still have, our neighborhood as it exists today is still incredibly white. It is incredibly segregated still. And that persists because of the origins of our neighborhood. And it was designed to look like that. 
the myth is if you created an integrated neighborhood, uh, you know, some kind of pie in the sky utopian scheme, uh, and then over time it's going to resegregate, right? It's going to self segregate. But Habitat just blows that myth out of the water. We just don't see these neighborhoods resegregating over time. Even as even as the first owner turns over, we, we continue to see these neighborhoods be be really thriving and vibrant neighborhoods that remain uh, that remain racially integrated. When we talk about reparations, you know, sure, people, some people said we need to give all uh, people a check if they can trace their lineage back to slavery. But what is that really going to accomplish? You know, will that correct what we need to do as far as level the playing field to make sure that our kids, our grandkids, that they have the opportunities that they should have? But we've got to correct the system, so to speak, from what it is now. We can decide to stop pretending, to really put together the resources, to devote the resources to dismantling these racist legacies within our institutions, to heal the divided land that we find ourselves in. So for one, you can, we can start by learning. Uh, there's amazing scholars doing, uh, doing work uh, right now to, to tell parts of our history that we haven't, haven't heard before. There's great opportunities locally to engage in, in those conversations. Dig in yourself and, and you know, start with your own deed and figure out you know, what the history is of, of, of your property. I'm convinced the only way we're going to change America now it's from the bottom up. We can't expect it to come from Washington, the top down. But I think as people, we all have got to do our part. And we've got to hold our elected officials, make them accountable. And if they don't do their job, next. You know, and I think the older I get, the more I realize now, you know, sure it's black and white still, but it's the have and have nots, you know. I've seen things change from what we were fighting for in the 60s to today. You can't correct what's happened, you know, all these years overnight. But we got to start and get there. If you live in an area with a history of deed restrictions, follow the example that you heard in this film about Malvern Hills and talk to your neighbors and, and work to correct this legacy. And finally, there's so many people doing great work. They're the partners on this project, like Pisgah Legal, uh, groups like Hood Huggers, who are helping to reconnect uh, people with black neighborhoods and to, to reinvest in those neighborhoods. And then us here at Asheville Habitat. I mean, we work every day to uh, advance um, access to home ownership, to close the racial home ownership gap, and to bring people together to build homes, to build communities, and to build hope. Just excited about having our own place to be us and grow. I think it, it just opens up opportunity for her. For one, it's kind of paving the way for her to eventually own a home one day. If, you know, if it's not my home, you know, she'll just be motivated because her mom owns a home.